Amazing, right? Now it's time for Q&As. So we'd like to hear what are the questions that are present in the room. I'm sure there's a lot of questions present. So if you have a question, just stand up and we'll bring you a mic. We'll take a few questions and then they will start answering. Thank you. I'm curious what your definition of partnership is and if you have other uh, role hierarchies of relationship or if that is even a hierarchy. We, we answer direct to the questions. So partnership for me is in a way connected to the universe where the trust is in the center and suddenly you will recognize we are meant to go a path together. And I would warmly recommend that we don't decide this after the first falling in love, but that we really take a bit time. For example, with my partner, we, after three years, we noticed that we are really meant as partners. And with a partner, I share a task in this world. I share interest. And Eros is one important part, but not the only one. And in the beginning, I always thought, oh, I want to have maybe three partners. But the reality is different, and I can really say, life brought me to this, that I have one real deep, deep core partner, and I have other friends, and I love the adventure. And for me, it's very important to make this visible. For example, that we don't become this kind of liars where we are, in reality, we are mainly interested in an adventure. And then we make all this honeymoon talks to each other. Oh, you are so nice. I love you. I want to stay with you. No, be truthful. <laughs> and also in the community, it's important to say, yes, to him, I feel this kind of partnership. You are also very important for me to make this transparent. This creates trust. Now I would say yes, in this deep kind where I would say now after 30 years I'm ready to marry you. This, I have one partner. And there are others where I'm also since more than 30 years, we again and again meet or sometimes we have journeys together. But this is not this daily partnership which I share with Delon Dieter Du. Yeah. I want to add, because it's so current for me, this research uh, of partnership. And I actually had the same. When I came to Tamara, I was asked, um, close your eyes, connect deeply to yourself. How many love partners are you meant to have? Like three. <laughs> and then I laughed when she said that, because um, it's not in principle impossible or forbidden, but who has a time? <laughs> no. In a, in a community in Italy, Damanhur, they say, be in your love relationships as long as it serves the community and the whole. And a committed love partnership where you really go deep takes time and space. Actually, in my experience, it takes less and less time the more you find your common task. And still, three partners, not forbidden, if this is up and true and there, but I also have one like main partner, and I would say, um, we have a beautiful saying in Tamara, love starts where you can really do something for each other. So in many places I find that the partner I'm with, back there, <laughs> um, sorry, um, is the person that on the deepest level can do the most for me and the other way around. And the most beautiful moments are when we can do that, help each other, really support each other, even in our erotic expression to others. This is such a deep sense of partnership, if that happens, that I feel, wow, she really supports that I'm totally attracted to this other, other woman. 
And not just a one night stand, she even supports that I have a weekend with her or whatever. This is a very, very deep sense of partnership. If you can contain that with each other, I would call that partnership. I'm curious, you mentioned that at uh, one point you had 50 people who were not very friendly to each other in the same house. And I'm curious how you transform that. You mentioned social structures. And I, I, you're probably going to go into this in the weekend, but I imagine, I was wondering if there's an example, a concrete example you could give of something that the social structure that helped transform that or maintain what you have now. I, I need some help for that I understand your question. One of the most important part was what we called the so-called forum. And we met really every day in the community together and we had the challenge to bring the things which were um, important for us. So often already in the morning we thought, what will I bring into the forum this evening? And we did a lot of training to make it really, uh, to find a creative way in it. So if you sit together and then you start to talk, oh, I don't feel so well today, I have pain because he was doing this and blah, 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 blah. It becomes boring. And so we had to find ways. And the forum was really, for me, it's the core of our community, which created the new social structures. This was the core that we could bring things to transparency. And then even you will discover that the so-called shadow sites, for example, if you are able to bring this on the stage like a theater play, you can play your pain body out. Yeah? You can use it without hurting others. So, for example, if you are jealous and you go to the forum, you can perform it like the goddess of Hera and you suddenly discover the joy in it. And you also discover, okay, I misuse of this power of jealousy to own my partner. Yeah? But by the, the forum helped us to go through these things. This was the core of developing new structures. And then later, of course, we have women's council, we have men's council, we have elders council, which uh, always help to keep the transparency in the community alive. And then we have working times. For us, it's really important. The community is such an important part in the whole that we mainly give a lot of awareness every day to the community. So we have working time and we have community time. Yeah. We have forum every day. Um, you mentioned something about um, possession, right? Uh, we can't own something, it's not something to be owned by anybody, but um, in that case you're talking about a physical um, object, something that actually exists. How do you translate that to money in relationships? Because money is an abstract thing and the moment it's there it causes, I've noticed, a lot of conflict. So if you could please. I start, um, in a way I would say Tamara is a community where we uh, practice gifting economy. But we did not make this as a decision or as a tool where we make a law out of it, it happened. So we started the community and we were not ask, give your money in, but if you start to love something, you will give it in by, by itself, because you don't have the feeling, I have to protect myself. You feel this is my home, and so you invest the whole. And so, in this sense, the money was for me it, very interesting, because always, I would say, how could you make this happen, that the whole community works? It was done by miracles. And always, if the vision was clear, the money came. 
But we had always to work on this, that we really have and share the same vision. And then the flow could enter. So this is my answer. We are now a bit more in a deeper work with it to build a foundation, what we call the Grace Foundation. And I said, Benjamin, please answer this because he is the director for this foundation right now. And I passed it on because I'm so passionate about this exploration right now that I had to think, okay, it's not about a whole lecture now about ownership, love, and uh, economy. So um, what, is, what is the question really about? And in a way, I bring it back to restoring healthy relation of not owning the earth and life and my partner because money in the end it's only an abstraction of this wrong programming and it's an explosion um, you from this wrong program and this wrong concept you grow an economy which does not work and in the end it is so simple so and then it gets a lot more complex but I don't think that's for tonight but I am very passionate about it, and if people are, please connect in the moment afterwards, because I love to talk about it at length. <laughs> I'm just looking also on this side. Looking also on this side, so people... Hi, first I want to thank you so much for this incredibly important healing work that you're doing. So I have a question about building relationships and communities of trust, which is so important. Um, I don't know about Portugal, but here in the United States, and including in the Bay Area, um, this is such a society built on patriarchy, on white supremacy, on ableism, on heterosexism, on transphobia. I'm sorry, do you need to do some German translation? It's very clear, although now I understand Okay, uh, I'm sorry, let me speak louder, great. So what I was just saying was, um, my question has to do with building trust when we're living in a society where there's, it's so deep, the way we're socialized in white supremacy, in patriarchy, in heterosexism, in transphobia, in ableism, in classism, ageism, and so many other forms of institutional oppression that runs so deep. And when you're talking about truth, for some people, myself included, initially some of these horrible lies feel true. And it takes a process of decolonization, um, of freeing one's mind. And I'm just wondering what the process of collective liberation is to free ourselves from these harmful systems of oppression so we can truly see, um, have relationships of trust, mutual respect, caring, and love. I don't know whether this was really a question, but I agree. <laughs> yeah. But to say in short words, for me it was really, really important to discover the healed picture that it exists. There is so much damage, so much pain of patriarchal culture and all this kind of... There's a lot. And for me it was important that, for example, you see if the earth is wounded, all nature goes there to heal the wounds. And there is existing a healed universal power if we reconnect. And I think as we are part of the universe, there is something in our cell system, what I call the memory. And behind the fear and behind the wounds, there is the memory of something very healthy. And we have to support each other to find this memory. And then it's easy. Um, I also want to point out that your list could have even been longer. It's kind of infinite. But they are symptoms of a sense of separation and fear at the core of it. And that is why we say a community, a healing biotope, to heal this core. Because all the isms that you enumerated and many more, they are symptoms. They are not the cause, not in our understanding. So when we say healing biotope, we try to come to this core level, this root level of conflict and fear and heal that and then we don't have to think about all the things that you enumerated in detail. It's the idea of a system change 
and not just healing one area of our life or one subject of injustice, social, gender, whatever, but really looking what is a human trauma at the root of it. And we do believe that if we get to this root and if we create a model for a healed version of a society and a culture where there is trust and not fear at this root, that all these isms will look either disappear or look so different. It will be creativism and <laughs> beautyism and eroticism <laughs> and, or no ism anymore. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I really appreciate the vision you were speaking of, and I've even experienced it, and what it can be like with a hundred people, people that you know and you recognize you can build trust with, you're talking about forum, connecting with a community. And I'm wondering if you can share anything about what, do you have any uh, vision that you can speak of for a community that's a city? Um, what could we bring into a city where we will be interacting with many people on a daily basis we do not know and have not built trust with? Beautiful question. And um, obviously we try to create this model, it's a rural community. And still, if we hear the principle, it will not be different in a city. My vision of it is that even in a city that will be a decentralized system of uh, smaller communities where you actually do know, where you're embedded in a community of trust, and starting from there, and then Vera often says, imagine a world where you know, looking from Tamara, where you know every person you meet has this level of embedment. You trust it. Imagine what kind of dialogue you would start. You wouldn't be careful, like cautious, will I hurt him or will he hurt me? Because I am embedded in such a community of trust, maybe in my whatever little quarter of the city, and everybody else I meet is as well. And then the contact will be on a totally new level. Part of that is for me that these urban communities are also grounded, at least to a certain degree, in food, energy and water. I cannot see mega cities in a healed future where this connection is not re-established. This relation to earth, water, food and each other. And then I'm looking really forward for the first courageous people and I know it's happening, there are urban um, communities all over, but it is very challenging to do so in a matrix, in a cultural matrix which is pointed or aimed as distracting yourself from this core layer all the time. So I imagine this model of a community that is healed needs some protection, like a seedling in the beginning. It needs a protection to grow. The beauty in information, the basic matter of our life, and not matter, the basic uh, unit of our life, not matter, but information, if it is created somewhere, it can spread everywhere. There are field building powers. And once we find a few of these communities where it fully works and this information of trust and reconnection is established, there's actually the possibility that all over the world, through the field building effect, we access the same knowledge. Sabine says we can even access it now because it's in our memories thousands of years ago, but it will be current. And I don't even need to know that somewhere in Oregon there is a urban uh, community which comes through. In our system of information, we will access it if we have the right question and if we put this question forward. This is actually a big part of why I believe that with the mess we are living in and that we keep not to f try not to feel most of the day, we try not to feel the emergency call of the earth. But with that perspective and this inner knowledge that this information will actually spread around the world, not by missioning people or convincing people, but because it's true to life and it's accessible wherever people ask the same question. Go on, I think this was a quite complex answer. I. Yeah. I 
I'm gonna head to the back next to get all of you as well. Hi. What guidance can you give people who would like to start local tribes, local networks? Maybe they're not ready to move into communities yet. But they might want to start networks of some kind, practice the values and practices that the mayor community practices. Yes, I think maybe this is a part to add to this answer, that uh, there are so many levels. Tamara has the, is a research center where we try to figure out on all levels how is peace possible. But not every community has to take this complex kind of part. And if I would live in a town, I would, for example, start to invite once a week people and study a text together. For example, and then because also forum needs training, so I would maybe start with very simple sharing. There are methods which we can learn from the old tribal wisdom, just deep listening to each other. And if then community starts to grow, then I would send some of the people for a while to quite developed community centers to say, let's go and study there to deepen the aspects. We don't have to repeat all the mistakes they made. They learned from the mistakes, so they can give us some tools and answers. But I think at the moment, for example, to meet together for the question, what can we do together for the water? And to meet regularly in the city or wherever. Can we make it happen that at our place, no rainwater will leave this place, for example? Or how can we create a self-sustainable garden in our city where we can share, so that we share a common interest and a common work? This I would give as advice. And then my vision is always that there will be created something like a pilgrim's path on the globe where young people can study different aspects of community wisdom. Yeah, we are the world. And in this sense, local communities have to find ways of networking and cooperation. Yeah. I want to add and stress this part of having a common objective task. Because we try to give a balance to inner and outer peace work. And I know in the luxury that I just assume most of us live in, we are not existentially threatened by uh, water, food and which most people right now are. So we live in a luxury. And there is a temptation to fall into process. And you can meet once a week and process. I'm afraid of you, maybe you're afraid of me, I'm afraid that you, and maybe you, and you are in the hierarchy, I think you are higher, and I want to be as well. And, and you can process yourself infinitely while a world out there dies. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate the applause in this place. Yeah, because it often, <laughs> it often worries me that um, actually some of the very um, privileged people are going, falling for that temptation, that they start circling only around themselves and then a group only around itself. So what Sabine just said, we take care that the water in our surrounding, even a city, it is healthy, is going towards healing, let's put it this way. This is an amazing task, and we need this objective task, else we continue our patterning over and over again. We need a much larger vision and task that we put ourselves to service into, to uh, burn away some of the unnecessary ego shells that always prevent community. Hi. Um, Sabina, I heard you reference that in the beginning of your partnership that you had feelings of jealousy and through the support of the community and the structure of the forum that that is not where you are now. And I wonder how long for you that process took and kind of 
on average for people who come <laughs> to live with you. Really, like with that strong intention and strong support, like when the healing comes. In the beginning, I said, we thought we will have three years and then we have solved everything. So this was our young enthusiasm. Now I say, it takes a whole lifetime and we should be ready for this. And for me, mainly the question is how deeply we are ready. I cannot say how long it took that I have no jealousy anymore, but for me, it was important step by step in the beginning, if the jealousy is there, you start to, you have the feeling I have a right on this. So the first step was really to recognize, no, this is my sickness. And with this moment, everything can go quite quick. And normally there is a point, if I'm too much convinced that I'm in the right position, there is now a warning lamp and says, uh -uh. Always, if this kind of identification starts, it's something where you see the ego is working. And in this sense, I agree with Benjamin, there is not, no more time for all this kind of stuff. So if it's there, you watch it, you see it and say, okay, hello, and you go on with your work. This I learned quite deep. And the other point is, if you stay together and work, go through this process uh, to discover, for example, the jealousy normally comes if I already left something from myself as a woman. Women, they very often have this ten ten tendency to give away too much from themselves and then suddenly they start to become jealous. But the more I came to my real core, who I am in the universe, jealousy disappeared, there. it was no more there. And so I think really the advice to figure out who you are, you are, not your ego, who are you in the universe, is the healing which will bring you away from the ego and brings you back to your higher self. Thank you. And maybe at last, that very often I was so excited that I thought, now I have it. And this is evil. In this moment, boom, you go back. And so this is the reason why I say, no, it takes a lifetime. And really enlightened we will be if the world is healed. Yeah. Maybe that is a chance um, to introduce some people who are here because we talk about field building. And again, they did amazing work in the beginning and it was really rough love. I only know the stories, but it was rough. When I came 18 years ago, it was still kind of rough. <laughs> and actually, we can observe how the next generations actually pick up on that knowledge. And they're starting a field for this love free of fear to emerge. And I imagine people growing up in such a new culture will have very different questions and many of the trouble not anymore that we have. And I want to once that, uh, because we sit up here now, but we are here with a good part of our community and maybe once the people of Tamara, because there are lots of young people from Tamara here, get up so that you are visible and inshallah they will have a different process with all of this. Some of us are even... born into that project and um, if there's a chance afterwards that you can also ask them so that you know who they are. So actually that kind of led to my question is, is there a specific vision at Tamara of at some point being a, a ethnic, an ethnically and racially diverse place and has there been any challenges or obstacles or lessons in that vision or process? Yeah. I saw a lot of questions, so we try to be shorter. Um, it's becoming an eth ethnically diverse place slowly. 
Um, the challenge is it was started in Germany. It was it has also some um, cultural aura of German, like I'm thinking and well, mm, we're gonna, mm, and actually it's pretty dangerous to be a German and say like okay we want to heal the world. So there are many challenges, but the vision of it is definitely ethnically diverse, but more important, the vision of it is universal, so that it will have many different types of healing biotopes or such communities in different cultures. And they will look very different, but I do believe at the core they will have the same humanistic uh, values. And this is coming now. There are Israelis, actually Israelis and Palestinians, quite a few living in Tamara. We have we have different, but it's coming slowly. And, in, and also to say that we are in cooperation with many places in the world. So people come for some months to Tamara, but we are in interaction with Colombia, with Brazil, with Israel, Palestine. So we are a lot being in Tamara, but also globally networking. And you asked for challenges. Oh, yes, we had. And we still have. So because uh, this is also a learning to bring the inner part together with the outer part. And the main challenge we had in the beginning was that we are a cult. And I think if you look to the world, nearly every community, if she starts to grow, she has to face this because it's a pattern to bring them down. And I still remember the situation where we did not know whether we will survive because there was so much fright from the outer world. And this brought us really on a deep level together because we noticed we won't leave each other anymore and even if we have to become pilgrims. And by finding this solidarity, we could learn what it means not to have an enemy in the outer world, but to work inside of us looking, maybe we were too enthusiastic, maybe we touched the issues in a way that people felt threatened, and so it was a deep learning and peace work. Yeah. Um, is it on? Yeah. I, I'm really refreshed by your um, passionate practicality towards earth care and um, in this country a bit more than in England I feel um, pretty surrounded by a lot of for want of a better word apathy or, 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 or surrender like oh the democracy is too broken it's too late um, look at what China's doing I could put solar panels on my house but um, <laughs> Why bother, given the scale of what's happening? Uh, and then this uh, tremendous energy going into the, the personal and the interpersonal healing. And I, and I just love what you're embodying in front of me in terms of the, the, the balance between those two things. And I guess I'm wondering in your guidance, like how to be in the face of that apathetic attitude. There is a sentence in German, and I will call it in German, and you translate it. Gleichgültigkeit ist der Faschismus der modernen Zeit. Indifference is the fascism of our time. Yeah. And I think this is the part um, where we have to find healing the most. Because at the moment, the peace movement is really in, in danger, I feel, because there is this too late and a burnout and so on. And, uh, for example, I like a lot to guide pilgrimages and to bring people to real crisis areas. And mainly not to help them, also to help them, but mainly to help us to open our heart and to figure out what compassion does mean. And I feel really the emergency call of this planet is quite strong. And not to make this as a pressure, to, but to find nourishment in the healing and facing the healing powers and then connect with them. 
And I think I, I'm looking for all the people who dare and who say, even if the planet will end tomorrow, I will plant a tree because I'm connected with life and not with death. Yeah. You want to add? Because you asked what attitude or how to face this attitude. And many times I'm indignated, I'm furious around this apathy, all the way to the point that I recognize it in myself. And politically, I might not be a path, uh, a path, whatever, indifferent, because I'm an activist and so on. But then I discover these places in my life where I'm so wounded that I'm actually turned away from it. And on a collective level, that is what indifference is. And um, discovering this in me, I also discover the pain that is behind this protection. And many times on the pilgrimages we notice it's not just a little pain. It's not just, oh, poor, poor hungry children and you have one tear. It is, it is so deep, I often don't have tears anymore. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It's so overwhelming when I open this ocean of tears that is our collective um, consensus to ignore. That I also, with people who are indifferent, I feel, wow, they are really hurt. And I know this place where I turn away because it's painful. And I, I do think we have a chance to come through. But I also believe that as a species, we are in survival mode. We, we know that as a species, not as individuals, Americans, Germans, whatever, as a species, we are threatened. And we use a lot of energy to ignore that. So part of my vision is that when we start entering and allowing this pain to emerge, and that is huge, so do it in good company where you hold each other and where you have to pers a perspective to channel it towards to. Without a perspective, I will not touch that pain. With a perspective and held in community, I can start to un un um, unwrap and actually feel how much pain there is. And this energy, not holding it down, can be the potential to create a new world. Check on time. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm curious about this process of healing and holding up the mirror and the forum, how that happens in your community. I'm wondering if there are people that are considered expert or authority, and if that's the case, if there's a way that you deal with projections. Yeah, I think the projection is a very, very important part and to become aware of it. For example, me, I'm a co-founder of the community. I was really young and very quick I was in the situation like being the mother of the tribe. And there is this positive projection, wow! And then shortly afterwards there comes the negative projection. <laughs> and. It is a learning, even there, not to be identified with either the positive or the negative side, but bringing transparency to it. And for me there, the forum is, it's like the core, where if you, I think every community will have natural authorities. And this is the process of who are the ones who have the most experience and to whom we trust. And these authorities need a training that they really support others to become a natural authority. So it's not about hierarchy, and I would say it's about basic democracy, but it's a learning to come in a process where you really take responsibility. And this I think you can learn from tribes. There exist tribes who have a lot of wisdom. And... Uh, the hierarchy is dangerous for communities. I think a lot of them failed because they did not support that really also the lowest part in the community can give mirrors. 
And so a community has the task that we always create spaces that people dare to mirror. And this is a process. This is a long process of trust. And for we always say people are often so excited about forum that they think three, four forums, great, and then they also start forum. And this can be dangerous. We always say, please, please be careful. Come and study. Because, uh, because of all these projection questions. And the forum's leader has the task not to be too identified with anything so that he can really work with the energies which come. And if he feels, now I am identified, he has, to, has the task to give the leading to another person and says, now I have to go to the forum because I have something inside of me, a reaction or anger or fear and to make it transparent. Yeah. In a way, um, experts, um, we have people who facilitate it and um, we are considered experts by our community. This is why we sit here. And I want to say something positive about hierarchy without um, having another opinion than Sabine, but I discovered not so long ago what hierarchy means. And hierarchy means sacred order. And that doesn't mean one above the other, it means um, people in their place. And then, of course, having elders with more knowledge is part of a natural hierarchy of trust. And in a way, the, on a human or psychological level, I fully agree with the projections um, how we, that we work with them and kind of dismantle them. Sometimes we also get creative and say the positive projection we very consciously put out and onto other people. We project the best that you can be onto you and in this forum we will mirror that back to you. You will feel, not an e on an ego level, but on a deep level of who you are, seen and met on the highest potential. Because our projections are an incredible power and not just psychologically in our relationships, but in the very core, how reality is created. It is very hard to determine how much of our reality is objective and how much of that is of a projective nature. So becoming aware of projections and using them is vision work. Projecting actually a global culture of peace is vision work. And it's not arbitrary, it's not just, okay, yeah, it's all gonna be a beautiful vision of peace. It's, it's deep work if you do vision work. It's not, it's not random, but there is something where we regain our power of projection in creating vision and in creating reality. And I feel this is very, very urgent for us to regain this power, not just individuals, but as collectives. <laughs>